Well, welcome everybody and uh, thank you very much for the splendid turnout. I'm Andrew Coburn, the Director of the College of Medicine, Biology and Environment, and it's my pleasure to be um, Chair of today's lecture. Uh, obviously attendance is extremely good, but you may know people who've been unable to attend the lecture or are interested in following up on the material that's to be presented. And uh, the lecture will be taped and it'll be available as a podcast on the, um, the ANU website. So we have a reasonably tight schedule, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the Acting Vice-Chancellor, Professor Lawrence Cram, who will say a few words of introduction. Thank you uh, very much, Andrew. Let me start by giving what's traditional at important functions at the ANU, an acknowledgement of land. In this spirit of reconciliation, the Australian National University recognises that it's situ situated on country for which the Ngunnawal people have been custodians for many centuries and on which they have performed age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal. We acknowledge their living culture and unique role in the life of this region and offer our deep appreciation for their contribution to and support of our academic enterprise. I think I have to start by acknowledging Sharon's amazing work in bringing today together and uh, there'll be more said about that, I'm sure. The topics that... <laughs> the topics that are going to be discussed this afternoon are politically challenging and deeply important for humans. I happen to have the privilege of presiding over a, a function earlier in the week where ANU staff and students were expressing their condolences for the terrible events that occurred in Japan uh, about 20 days ago. And I happened to have spent this morning with a group of people who were very eager to assist ANU with a more ethical approach, not, not from our point of view, but a more ethical approach generally for the world to the issues of development. And while my academic background is not in either of those fields, I think that everybody who thinks about the state of the world, the state of what it might be like, and the state of what it is like, would feel that a meeting like the one that you're having today is really extremely, extremely important. And I hope that in addition to talking about these issues, that universities like the ANU can play a part in actually making, making a difference. It's a very rare opportunity to have internationally renowned ex experts in these areas. Sir Michael uh, is, is probably the world's leading voice in the social de determinants of health. Tony McMichael has, f has understood better than most the links between climate change and health around the world. And Stephen Howes is extremely well versed in the way that governments from wealthy countries succeed and fail in the delivery of programs to address some of the problems that you're dealing with today. The ANU takes these issues very seriously. We aim to understand how Australia works, that's true, but we also aim to understand how Australia works as a part of the global community and how a university like the ANU can can make its contribution on the global scene. I don't think I could finish these opening remarks without reminding us all of the fact that Australia itself has issues that are yet unresolved, particularly relating to the health of our Indigenous people. And the ANU has played very important roles in trying to assist the community come to understand how the health of Indigenous Australians is affected by cultural and social, um, social factors, things that, even if we understand them, we really don't know how to grapple with their consequences. We have a lot of interest and expertise in East Asia and the Pacific regions as well, the same kind of issues. And it's really very timely and very appropriate that we come together today to hear some of the leading thinkers in these issues um, explain to us how they're thinking and possibly, I, as I say, uh, offer us some suggestions about how we might go forward. So uh, I, um, I'm going to stay here. I'm not supposed to stay here, but I'm going to stay here 
to listen to today. I think it's so important. And uh, I'll ask Andrew Coburn now to introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much. So today's first speaker is Professor Sir Michael Marmot, uh, who's from the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health at University College London. Uh, as Lawrence mentioned, he has an extraordinarily distinguished record in dealing with the health consequences of social inequity and uh, a glittering career that's involved both uh, distinguished academic research and um, a variety of extremely important public roles. Uh, and I won't list those at length, but among those, he's currently president of the British Medical Association. So it's a pleasure to welcome Michael Marvin. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much indeed. Echoing your opening remarks, uh, these are crucially important issues for society and indeed for the world. The phrase a global movement Ambitiously, perhaps, naively, certainly, when we began the Global Commission on Social Determinants of Health, we said we wanted to create a global movement for social determinants and health equity. Wiser people than I said, you really ought to take that seriously. Social movements are studied, understood, they don't just come. But I would say there are signs that we have been creating such a movement. The Global Commission on Social Determinants of Health was set up by the World Health Organization and it reported at the end of August 2008. We entitled our report, Closing the Gap in a Generation. And we said, the reason that one should be taking steps to closing the health gap in a generation is not an economic one. It was put to us that governments would only take seriously an argument if it somehow improved the bottom line. Uh, I understand from my then teenage children that the bottom line is um, which isn't quite what we had in mind. Um, we said, forget the bottom line. Our interest was promoting social justice. The reason for being concerned about health inequities was an ethical one. And we said we were trying to achieve empowerment of individuals, communities, and indeed of whole countries. When people think about health inequity, commonly they think about poverty, and indeed poverty is associated with ill health. But the insight underlying my research over the last three, four decades, and indeed the Global Commission and the English Review of Health Inequalities that I'll mention in a moment, was that health follows the social gradient. This graph comes from the English Review of Health Inequalities. Each of these dots represents a small area of England classified by neighbourhood income deprivation. The top line is life expectancy. You can see this gradient in life expectancy by level of neighbourhood deprivation. People near the top, the least deprived, have shorter life expectancy than those at the top. People in the middle have shorter life expectancy than those near the top. Those a third of the way from the bottom shorter than those in the middle. It's a graded relation. True, if we looked at the bottom 5% and compared them with the top 5%, the gap is seven years. But the drama is not the difference between top and bottom, but the graded relation between income deprivation and life expectancy. So simply thinking about this as an issue of poverty is clearly inadequate. The bottom graph is disability-free life expectancy. 
you see a gradient, but it's now steeper. The gap between the 5th and the 95th centile is now not seven years, but 17 years. And the implication of the steeper gradient, people at the top live about 12 years on average with disability, and people at the bottom live about 20 years of their shorter lives with disability. And again, when we were conducting the English review, it was put to me that we should make the economic case. My response was, well, how are we going to deal with this 20 years of life spent with disability down the bottom? Hand out free cigarettes to the poor. It's cheap. Be quite cost effective. You don't look very excited by that idea. <laughs> of course you're not excited by that idea. It's morally corrupt. We don't do things just because they're cheap and effective. We do what's right. And the simple thought experiment of a cost-effective mechanism exposes the fact that we have moral absolutes. That we have a moral argument for taking action on health inequities. Now this green line here, in case you're not convinced by the moral argument, let me give you an economic one. This green line here represents retirement age. The government in Britain, the previous government, wanted to advance retirement age to 68 by 2046. <coughs> The current government wants to do that more quickly. If retirement age was 68 today, three quarters of the population do not have disability-free life expectancy as long as 68. If the effect of prolonging retirement age to 68 was to move people off pensions onto disability benefits, that would be a dubious social advance and save no money at all. Now I've shown these data and trying to make the argument, shown these data to politicians and I talk about social determinants of health and they go, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm used to the sort of politician brush off. Mm -hmm, very interesting, yes, oh, good work, good work, keep up the good work. And then I show them this graph. Oh my God, we need to take this seriously. Oh, why didn't you show me this in the first place? I might have concentrated. <laughs> and we don't just see the gradient in rich countries. It's been put to me that the gradient is somehow an effete concern of rich countries. This is from Brazil. Gradient in cardiovascular <coughs> deaths, socioeconomic level of districts, high, medium, high, medium, low, low. It's a socially graded phenomenon. If we look at the demographic and health surveys at under five mortality, in country after country, we find this graded relation. People have said to me, now seriously, shouldn't we just focus on the bottom 10%? Isn't that the real poverty? And the answer is no. It's a graded phenomenon. The second quintile from the top has higher under five mortality than the one at the top. In the commission report, we said this unequal distribution of health damaging experience is not in any sense a natural phenomenon, but is the result of a toxic combination of poor social policies and programs, unfair economic arrangements, and bad politics. We thought we shouldn't be too strong. We should <laughs> cloak the message a little bit. And we had three principles of action the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age, the structural drivers of those conditions at global, national and local level, and the importance of monitoring, training and research. And in the, we had recommendations on each of these areas. And in the structural drivers, we looked at how these operate at societal level and indeed at international and global level. I was in Norway for a meeting last year and the Minister of Foreign Affairs 
said, I am a health minister. Every minister is a health minister. What we do in our day job impacts on health. I have to be careful about this, being president of the British Medical Association this year. This is not the doctors taking over. It's a recognition that what happens in every aspect of society affects health. And if politicians and policy makers from other spheres say, why should we take this issue seriously? The argument we put is that health and well-being are outcomes of policies taken in other spheres. Is empowerment just loose language? I think not. These data were given to us by our colleagues in British Columbia and Canada. Looking at empowerment of communities, communities were classified by their degree of participation in self-government, land claim participation, and the degree of community control on health services, education, cultural facilities, and police and fire services. Uh, mysteriously, the number here is in white, so it's on white. But trust me, this is the number of factors present, communities classified. And this is youth suicide. Chillingly, the less the empowerment, the more likely are young people to kill themselves. Greater community control, more involvement in self-government and land claim participation protects young people from taking their own lives. Data from India, looking at empowerment in action in young people. In these experiments, 11 and 12 year old children were given some intellectual puzzles to do. They had to solve mazes. And in the first group of experiments, no attention was drawn to their caste background. The children came from lower caste and higher caste, but no attention was drawn to the caste background. And under those conditions, the lower caste children performed equally well with the high caste children. And then in a second group of experiments, attention was drawn publicly to the caste background of the children. And under those conditions, the lower caste children performed dramatically worse. And the experimenters did a whole series of other experiments and they interpreted their results as showing that once the lower caste children knew that figures in authority knew their caste background, they were disempowered. No point trying. The situation's rigged against you from the beginning. I showed these data at a meeting in the United States and an African-American colleague came up and gave me a big hug. I got very English at that point. So <laughs> and he said, now you know what it means to grow up in the inner city in the US. This is what we see, disempowerment in action. And this, of course, then relates to what happens for the rest of their lives, to social and economic circumstances, and to health. Our colleagues from the Self-Employed Women's Association that began in Gujarat talk about empowering communities. One of the key issues that the Self-Employed Women's Association, SAVA, has had to deal with is informal settlements, living in slums. They got the community get together and said, what do you want? And the women who are members of SAVA said, we do not want to be moved but we'd quite like to have a bathroom and somewhere to cook and running water. That would be great. They upgraded the slums in Ahmedabad. They negotiated loans of $500 per household. The women themselves had to contribute $50. If you're on a dollar a day, 
$50 is enormous. And following the investment, there was decline in waterborne diseases, children started going to school, women were able to take paid work. This is what it looked like before, and this is what it looked like afterwards. This is empowerment in action, improving health at very low cost. In the Global Commission, we made a whole series of recommendations, but we had a global reach. We were thinking about Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia and Latin America and North America and Europe, East Asia and so on. How could you make a set of recommendations that would apply equally in all those disparate conditions? And we tried to make a virtue of necessity and said that it was vitally important to translate the CSDH, the Commission on Social Determinants of Health recommendations, into different contexts. There was a resolution at the World Health Assembly. I never thought in my life that I would reach the stage of my life where I thought what happened at the World Health Assembly was in any way important. Um, <laughs> this is something terrible has happened to me. Um, but I think it actually might be a little bit important that there was such a res resolution. Uh, Margaret Chan, Director General, gave ring a ringing endorsement, or at least her speechwriter gave ringing endorsement to uh, the Commission's recommendations. Brazil set up its own Commission on Social Determinants of Health, President Lula holding the report of the Brazilian Commission. I detect a touch of sadness in his vision, but that's because Brazil was about to lose the World Cup. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, I had the honour to hand a copy of our report to Manmohan Singh, the Prime Minister of India. And Dr Singh said, what would you like me to do? And I thought, he's the Prime Minister of 1.2 billion people and I should tell him what to do? But with Mirai Chatterjee standing there, we had rehearsed the answer to this question. Uh, <laughs> And so I said what I said a few moments ago, that the Commission applied to the global community. Were India minded to take this on board and see how it could apply in the Indian context? It would be of great benefit to India and to the world. I said that life expectancy for women in India had gone from 50 to 63 in three decades. That was amazing. 13 year improvement in only 30 years. 63. But in Japan, life expectancy for women is 86. India had 23 more years to go. And why would you stop at 63? Why would you think that Indians biologically were different to Japanese? Let's work on the assumption that life expectancy in India ought to be the same as in Japan. So, much to do. Two of my colleagues will recognize um, the president of Sri Lanka. I only wish that when these photos were taken, I did not have a stupid smile on my face. But, um, so, when I met the president of Costa Rica, I made sure I had my back turned to the camera. Um, but she said she would make it a priority for her presidency. So. I don't know if this counts as a social movement, but actually getting the politicians to acknowledge the importance of social determinants and health equity has to be an important, albeit small step, in the right direction. One tangible result of the Commission was the government in the UK invited me to conduct a review of health inequalities in England and I'll say a word about that in a moment. And the regional director of WHO for Europe, Susanna Jakob, invited me to conduct a, a review in Europe, and that is ongoing. In the English review, we had six domains of recommendations. Give every child the best start in life, 
enable all children, young people and adults to maximise their capabilities, education, fair employment and good work for all, ensure healthy standard of living for all. What a radical recommendation. A rich society ought to make sure that every member of that society has the minimum, the minimum needed to have a healthy life. Create and develop healthy and sustainable places and communities and strengthen the role and impact of ill health prevention. Because I want to hear what the other two speakers have to say this afternoon. I'm not going to go through the evidence underlying all of these. But let me show you a little bit of the evidence. Give every child the best start in life. This is cognitive development, measures of cognitive development for children followed from 22 months of age to 10 years of age. And these are relative scores. So look at children who at 22 months of age were in the 10th centile of cognitive development. If they grew up in families of low socioeconomic status, they remain low. If they grew up in families of high socioeconomic status, they catch up. Look at the children who at 22 months were at the 90th centile. Those in families of high socioeconomic status remain high. Those in families of low socioeconomic status get a dramatic decline in their relative ranking. Assume for the moment that all the differences at 22 months were biologically determined. Genes, outcome of pregnancy, and that the differences associated with the socioeconomic status of the family were social. The social trumps the biological. Now, of course, not all the differences at 22 months are biologically determined. Conditions of rearing in early life matter enormously. Look at reading to children every day. Follows the social gradient. It was put to me that we were reporting into an adverse economic climate. Here's a really expensive intervention. Read to children daily. And if parents are scarcely literate themselves, ground down by poverty and misery, and find themselves unwilling or unable to read to their children, then can't we help in some way? Is that so difficult? I would presented these data to a group of chief executives of local government and chief executives of primary care trusts in England, and one chief executive of local government leapt to her feet and said, we should implement this this afternoon. What are we waiting for? And I said, go out and do it. We, the evidence is really strong. We really understand the drivers of early child development, but we don't quite know how to intervene. So go and try it and see, as I said before, if parents can't do it, can you help? In the Millennium Cohort study, we asked, is it important to cuddle a child? Can there be a more rewarding experience in life than cuddling a child? 20% of parents deny that it's important to cuddle a child. And that follows the social gradient. The lower they are, the more likely they are to deny that it's important to cuddle a child. Is it important to talk to a child? 20% of parents deny that it's important to talk to a child. And what do we see? The children of those parents have worse cognitive development, worse social and behavioral development. Why am I showing you this? We're talking about health inequalities. Because what happens in early childhood influences what happens in education, influences whether they get a job at all in an economically adverse climate, or what sort of job they have, the conditions in which they live, and health inequalities. And the context matters. I said in a rich society, everybody 
should have the minimum necessary for a healthy life. This is still England. What this graph shows is the proportion of total household income enjoyed by the top 20%. We climbed this steep cliff from about 37% to 42, 43%, and that's a huge increase, and then stayed there. So this was Margaret Thatcher, John Major, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, didn't make a jot of difference who the Prime Minister was. Once we climbed that cliff, we stayed up there. And this is the proportion of total household income enjoyed by the bottom 20%. It went from about 9% down to 7 6% and stayed there. That's income inequality. Now, the dotted line is post-tax. Can you see the difference our taxation system has made? I'm a doctor, what do I know about this clever economic stuff? If you'd asked me, I would have said, I thought we had a progressive taxation system. We do not. We have a proportionate taxation system. We have an income tax system that is progressive and a consumption tax system that is regressive. The result is that figures we put in our report, the top quintile of income earners pay 35% of their income in tax and the bottom 20% pay 38%. Now we called for putting fairness at the heart of all decision making. I think that's unfair. I think if we put fairness at the heart of all decision making, we would not do that. I'm sure you wouldn't do anything like that in Australia. <laughs> and I mentioned that we're conducting a European review. Euro is thought of in, among the WHO regions as being the rich region. This is life expectancy for women, a 12-year gap between Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Russian Federation, um, and France and Spain. For men, it's a 20-year gap. Life expectancy for men in the Russian Federation is 60, and in Iceland, it's 80. And it's no accident that the ones with the lower life expectancy from the former Soviet Union and the eastern part of the region Looking at inequality within countries, this is the estimate, these are male death rates by level of education, the inequalities, absolute inequalities, that's the European estimate there. Spain, Sweden, Italy, Denmark, England, Wales, Belgium, Norway, Switzerland, less than average levels of inequality Slovenia, the Czech Republic, Poland, Estonia, Lithuania, and Hungary. So Central and Eastern Europe, bigger inequalities. Major issues with which we have to deal in the European review. Just one example how government policy makes a difference. Our Nordic colleagues came up with a measure of family policy generosity and looked at child poverty. The more generous family policies the lower the child poverty level. So in Sweden and Norway, Finland, where they have generous family policies, they have very low levels of child poverty. USA, Australia doesn't look so hot. Uh, less generous family policy, high levels of child poverty. Policy makes a difference. Poverty isn't something that just happens out of the economic system. The policy makes a difference. We are, at the moment, about to conduct a grisly experiment in Britain of reforming the National Health Service. These figures from the Commonwealth Fund look at equity in access to health care and ask, does cost make a difference? So in Australia, 
people with above average income are less likely to report that cost was a barrier to access than people with below average income. I have to say that in my role as BMA president, I'm supposed to be apolitical. So here's an apolitical statement. We have the most equitable healthcare system in the world. We're crap at football, hopeless at rugby, but we're bloody good at getting equity of access to the healthcare system. Do not let any change interfere with that. This is a major societal achievement of which we can be proud. Do not in any way interfere with that. Not that I think equity and access to health care is the main driver of the health inequities that I'm talking about, but it's necessary to have equity and access to health care. I'm apolitical, by the way. When we, I just want to finish with Glasgow. When we launched the report of the Global Commission, I drew attention to Glasgow. Life expectancy for men in the poorest part of Glasgow is 54. And in the richest part is 82. Australian indigenous men, 67. Harry Burns, who's the chief medical officer for Scotland, and I have been talking over 15 years or so, and he's imbibed what we talked about in the Whitehall 2 study, the importance of having control over your life. He looked at mortality in Glasgow relative to Liverpool and Manchester, three post-industrial cities with similar levels of income inequality. But mortality is higher in Glasgow. And the four causes of death with the highest relative excess are drug-related poisonings, alcohol, suicide, and violent deaths. and then lung cancer, which is behavioral, it's smoking. And what Harry Burns says, a major element of the excess risk of premature death seen in Scotland is psychosocially determined. You can see it in those causes of death. And he points to study evidence of low sense of control, self-efficacy and self-esteem in populations in these areas. It's not just that mental health should be an important part of our goals for health equity, it should. But lack of control over your life is important for physical health as well and should be an important part of what we're trying to achieve. I called my English review Fair Society, Healthy Lives. Put fairness at the heart of all decision making. And at least in part what I mean by that is creating the conditions in which individuals and communities have control over their lives. Thank you. So the spe second speaker in today's session uh, is Professor Tony McMichael, who is here at the ANU, working in the National Centre for Epidemi Epidemiology and Population Health. Um, Tony, again, has an exceptionally distinguished career in epidemiology. Uh, starting with uh, groundbreaking work on environmental causes of health and subsequently becoming the leader of a very large research program which focuses on uh, the importance, I guess, of change to health outcomes, particularly in the context of a world where the climate is changing very rapidly. Tony. Okay, well, it's a pleasure for me also to have an opportunity to be part of this uh, presentation and discussion this afternoon, ranging across these three very important but of course interrelated realms of the social, the environmental, the economic influences um, on patterns of health, health outcomes, um, health status distributions, and therefore health inequity issues. Um, now you might think that there, there's a bit of a tension, a tension, uh, between the first and the second talks in that um, we have these problems uh, of persistent health inequalities. We deem most of them to be health inequities. Uh, on our plate today, they remain a, uh, an important challenge and uh, 
Uh, I think, Michael, you'd, you'd agree that in general they're not showing signs of going away quickly. We've seen in the last decade, for example, uh, approximately a 10% increase um, in the absolute numbers of persons deemed to be undernourished, mostly young children in uh, food insecure parts of the world, and that increase incurring uh, at a time when the world population increased by just around 5%. So that's one area where the, um, the problem has been increasing, not decreasing. So I would say that in relation to um, at least these first two presentations, the issues of inequalities you'll understand are really quite uh, central uh, to both stories. I think the other important point uh, is that we, we do need to understand that um, there is not uh, a separateness between now uh, and the future. The sort of world that we're uh, moving into as increasingly via these enormous pressures that in aggregate all of us around the world are now putting on the natural systems that we rely upon for the very foundations of human health, the food, the fresh water flows, the natural constraints uh, on infectious diseases, the natural buffering against um, uh, physical disasters, extreme weather events. Uh, all of those uh, are, are, and more make up the, um, the basic life support systems upon which our population health depends. Uh, we don't always see it, of course, particularly from rich privileged societies living at uh, one or two removes from uh, the natural world. Uh, but when the chips are down, those are the things that uh, all of us ultimately will depend upon. And in such a world, um, if we continue on the apparent current trajectories, then uh, those trajectories will tend to undermine our best efforts to reduce health problems around the world, to achieve the UN's um, Millennium Development Goals, to get where we would like to on an equitable basis with respect to um, development projects. Uh, around the world. So I would like to suggest that there really is a, <clears throat> an important and seamless connection um, between the now and the future as we think about how we're going to uh, do better. Now, this is a, a recent and fairly iconic diagram that was published in the journal Nature uh, in 2009. Um, and um, one thing it stresses here is that, uh, as I said, we live in a world now where we have a number of unprecedented, large and complex environmental changes of regional and, in many cases, of integrated global kind, such as climate change or stratospheric o ocean, uh, ozone depletion or ocean acidification. Those things were not on the agenda 30 years ago when we talked environmental health. They're new, they're big, they're complex. They don't involve direct local toxicological hazards. They involve systemic disruptions and they're the sorts of things that um, will do what I said a moment ago. They will undermine, uh, in due course, the life support systems if we don't understand that they're happening and that we need to uh, modify, radically change the ways in which we, uh, we live. Now, something's a bit hard. Actually, this is where the, the two two screens could be useful. We could have one projector turned upside down here. <laughs> then you could read these ones at the bottom more easily. <laughs> uh, but um, if you look around the, uh, the circle there, you'll see that there are 10 major areas of um, environmental change ongoing in the world. And in the center, uh, there is that green area, which these authors deem to be the safe operating space. If we could restrict the adverse changes happening in each of those areas to within that green area, then at least we could hope that the world would remain safe and sustainable for human futures. And for three of them, we've already strayed on this assessment outside that boundary. Biodiversity loss down there at 8 uh, o'clock, um, disruption of the global nitrogen cycle, enormous increase in the amount of activated nitrogen compounds that are now circulating uh, in the biosphere, uh, as a result of human action, we've approximately doubled the rate of annual production of these sorts of nitrogenous compounds via uh, human industrial and agricultural activity. And then at the top, at um, 12 o'clock, climate change. Those are the three that are of obvious concern at the moment. And a reminder also that climate change doesn't exist on its own. It's the one I'll be talking about. Uh, it's, a, it's a very important, topical, big exemplar of the problems 
But uh, these are all part of a syndrome, uh, and they will interact with one another, and they will jointly impact on a number of areas, like food production. It's not just problems of climate change. It's, to an extent, uh, some increase in ultraviolet radiation exposure. It's depletion of fresh water supplies. It's dis disruption of ecosystems, loss of pollinating creatures. And uh, uh, these things all come together uh, around uh, some of the, uh, the major impacts that then bear on um, human societies, like food production. Now, just a quick slide to remind you of, the, um, of Earth's uh, temperature graph. Uh, and if you don't wish to quibble about year-to-year -year minor fluctuations, but just look at where it's heading generally, then it's, it's a bit hard to actually understand how apparently more clever people like ex-Senator Nick Minchin and, and Lord Monckton would conclude that uh, Earth is actually cooling. That temperature in 2010 on both of those uh, internationally reputable um, sets of, uh, of data um, shows that the year 2010 is very faintly uh, the warmest year yet on record. And uh, Michael Marmot referred to uh, how we might think clinically. I think if we were doing a ward round and saw this as a patient's temperature chart, we wouldn't say, oh, this looks good. The temperature's just starting to come down a bit. Stop taking the... <laughs> Stop taking the drugs. <laughs> now this one will stretch, stretch our minds a bit because it's stretching time out to um, back to the time of the demise of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. But these are some very interesting data on world's temperature chart over these last 65 million years. And um, uh, several points are Worth, worth making here, I, I think. For, oh, well, firstly, the paleoclimatologists in the last decade or two have become very good at reconstructing these graphs from all sorts of um, proxy measures. Um, and uh, th this graph concurs with uh, several others that have been produced by other research groups using um, similar and or different um, proxy measures. But notice that um, if the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is approximately right in assessing the published literature up to 2007 and that we're heading for a, uh, a world on current trajectories that could be warmer within the range of 1 to, two degrees, uh, one to 6 degrees centigrade on average, that would be the global average, bearing in mind that most of that variation in that range is not due to uncertainties about the climate change science, it's due to simply not knowing how human societies are going to behave over the next... Um, a uh, few decades and on into the later part of the 21st century. So if we take as a sort of comfortable mi mid-range, three to five degrees centigrade, let's say, as a sort of central estimate, if you relate that to this, uh, this diagram and ask when were we last three degrees warmer than now, well, it was about when our species, or our ancestral species, the hominids, um, split off from the, the chimpanzee line around five or six million years ago. A very different world. Five degrees centigrade, well, you'd have to go back 15 million years. Uh, a very different world. Now, we're not talking trivial temperature changes here. For gl sustained global average temperatures, these would be a big deal. These would be the sorts of worlds that we wouldn't recognise. Now, we wouldn't get there quickly if we take temperatures up to three, four, five degrees plus, and a number of our climate scientists are telling us that's where we're heading now, there's no doubt we're going to go past the two degree mark. Probably very likely we'll go past three. Um, not sure how much further, but um, it's not looking good. And if those were to be sustained over centuries, then of course, living conditions for human populations everywhere would become very, very different. And most of it would not be good, we think, for population health. Now, We heard from Michael Marmot about the bottom line, and I want to make a point about that as well here, and I'm going to show you the bottom line in just a moment, because on my argument, uh, all of the things that we're concerned about in the first instance, um, the, if you like, the, the upstream concerns about impacts of, um, uh, of climate change on uh, um, aspects of our economy, uh, on risks to coastal property, uh, on um, 
iconic species and ecosystems, uh, recreational amenity out there in the environment, all hugely important for us, of course. Th those are the things that seem to come to our mind first, and they're referred to uh, implicitly here in the top half of the diagram. But eventually, most of those adverse changes must have cons uh, consequences for our well-being and our health. There are three categories of pathways. The first one's pretty easy to understand. Uh, this is via direct impacts, things like uh, increased frequency of, um, uh, of severe heat waves. The ones that in the long run are likely to become the more serious risks um, would be of this kind, uh, disrupting uh, various ecological and geophysical processes out there that are part of these underpinnings of um, longer term population health, food, water, mosquito populations and so on. And then the third pathway, which picks up directly on some of the things that Michael Marmot has stressed to us already, that things that will further disrupt social and economic conditions of life, including um, the um, exacerbation of existing um, differentials, um, inequalities, uh, the displacement of populations, the likelihood of some tensions and conflict over dwindling resources. You'll all be aware of some of the um, flashpoints, potential flashpoints in the world for fresh water shortages over coming decades. Uh, the, these are the sorts of things that inevitably are going to um, contribute to changes in uh, patterns of population health, and particularly in those populations uh, that are the more vulnerable in terms of socioeconomic uh, and also geographical terms. Now you might ask, uh, what, uh, what do those of us working in this area do? And I just pause for a moment to, um, uh, to really summarise the, the categories of work that we do. Uh, no methodological detail, but just so that you can understand the spectrum. On the one hand, we can learn from the recent past, looking at natural variations in climatic conditions in different parts of the world and how they relate to health outcomes. If we know enough about the relation between climatic conditions and a health outcome, we can estimate the proportion of the total burden of disease from that condition, be it malaria or undernutrition, that is reasonably attributable to the small amount of climate change that has happened, uh, and some work on, of that kind has been done. We can begin to look around the world to try to identify early attributable impacts. And then, of course, we must look to the future, uh, because that is where we imagine the big risks will accrue on current trajectories. And we can do that in relation to various uh, agreed scenarios of plausible future climate change. Now, I'll give you just one example of each of these. This is a very simple example of some early work we've done looking over the last 40 years at the shift in seasonal distribution of deaths. This is just deaths from all causes. We want to go back and look at it in cause-specific fashion. Um, for men and for women, age 55 to 64, but you see over that 45-year um, period there's been an interesting drift of um, deaths from the winter months towards the summer months, and we'd like to know why. We're going to investigate that, but that's using recent past data to get a better understanding of um, relationships. Then there's this process of trying to attribute burdens of existing disease to the underlying uh, influence of climate change, and we did that in conjunction with WHO uh, earlier in the, um, uh, the past decade. And here's a um, cartogram representation of where most of that estimated attributable burden from climate change would actually lie. Uh, and here we see quite starkly, don't we, the moral dimensions of this, this problem looming very large. And those parts that are fat and large are not the parts that have done most of the emitting in the past, uh, although that's beginning to change with uh, China and India and Brazil, Mexico and others coming on stream, as it were. What about this question as to whether we're seeing anything yet? Well, this is always a tough one. Uh, in fact, the human species is a difficult species to study. That's the glory of epidemiology, you see. We have the really tough science, the stuff that goes out into the real world and asks questions about can we account for what uh, is a co what's causing differences in uh, rates of, uh, of disease and death in human populations. A lot easier than the lab sciences, I think, uh, Andrew. Just take your hundred rats, divide them into two groups. <laughs> Suppose one... Hmm? Don't do you don't do rats, sorry. 
finches. <laughs> um, okay. So um, it's not easy to, to call this one early, but these are some of the things, and I'm not going to go through them, but if you've ha had a chance to, to read through that, uh, these are some of the things that um, we think are starting to represent a signal to us now that there are some changes occurring um, that uh, might reasonably be attributable. And you see that um, second to last one in relation to um, drought and drying, and I was interested to see in um, a report that came from our Bureau of Meteorology last year uh, a conclusion that the current drought is clearly linked to global, global warming through the strengthening of the STR, the subtropical ridge, which is the, the high pressure zone that lies across the horizontally across the centre of Australia, a dry area, intensifying and widening, uh, and in the judgment of the Bureau, uh, this can be reasonably attributed to the underlying uh, warming that has uh, caused that intensification. So <coughs> these signals are not, not appearing in a hurry, but they're beginning to appear. And then looking to the future, saying, well, how might climate change, as we can best forecast it, affect some of these important health outcomes? And you see for malaria here, in a poor country that can hardly afford, um, even if it could organise itself, can hardly afford to spend a lot more money on public health prevention uh, in relation to mosquito control and bed nets and uh, early treatment of, um, of, of infected cases. Zimbabwe, that's the um, estimated uh, distribution of risk uh, the low risk areas being the purple and blue, the high risk being the orange and red. And uh, the, the big populations for the moment are up, up there in the, um, uh, the middling highlands, Harare and Bulawayo. Uh, but in 2025, this map starts to look rather different. And you can probably guess how it might look in 2050 on what is a medium climate change scenario projection for this country. Now, these things can't tell us what will happen, but they can tell us what could happen, uh, and that's a big message for trying to understand the dangerous path that we're getting onto and why we should get off it, uh, and also for, uh, for alerting societies and governments as to uh, how they might best gird their loins in preparation for this uh, future. The other major outcome, you know, coming towards the end here with these examples, um, the other major outcome I did want to mention is um, that, uh, with respect to food production, uh, absolutely central to, um, to good health, to child development, um, to physiological capacity in adulthood, uh, and to survival. And again, a very unequal picture. This was published by the UN Development Program. Uh, a few caveats. Uh, this modelling, of course, is, is never exact. There can always be criticisms of the, uh, the inputs, the assumptions. But the general picture is a, um, is a bleak one for many parts of the world, and that includes Australia. Uh, you might notice also why, perhaps why, one reason why the Chinese government has increasing interest in uh, having good control over Tibet, shown in dark green. And that was simple modelling, just temperature and soil moisture. If we take into account the more... Um, chaotic and unpredictable uh, imposts on food production to do with uh, those sorts of events. And remember, Russia lost 30% of its wheat production last year over the extremes of heat and those fires. These sorts of things are, are likely to, um, to add further detriment uh, in many parts of the world to um, potential for food yield. And the, uh, the Asian Development Bank has estimated how for these four major staples, um, cereal grain staples, how uh, climate change, the orange bar for each of them, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, how in the first instance prices are likely to go up by 2050 anyway because of stresses that there are in the food production system uh, and the growing population demands and indeed some of the shifts in um, consumer preference. But if you add to that the um, impost of climate change, then you can see that uh, on the bank's estimate, there could be substantial increases in food prices, and uh, we know who that will bear upon. Again, another source of uh, exacerbated um, <coughs> in, uh, inequality uh, and resultant health inequities. 
just with respect to um, this differential vulnerability, cyclones, hurricanes impinge very differently depending uh, on the vulnerability of the population affected. And in this case in Honduras, it was a problem of poor housing and physical infrastructure. A disaster occurred and there were resultant epidemics of these various uh, infectious diseases breaking out. Here in our, our region of the world, uh, an assessment of the um, relative um, capacity to adapt to climate change in these various countries, published a couple of years ago. Uh, but again, some considerable differences with the, um, uh, the, the greatest uh, risk being in countries like Laos and Cambodia compared to the rather better equipped Malaysia, um, Thailand, Vietnam, Singapore. The bank is also predicting that, um, that climate change and other environmental changes is going to uh, cause a great increase in um, the flows of uh, migrants and uh, refugees. Um, and there could be a message in this for one of our cyclist um, politicians. <laughs> that uh, A better slogan than stop the boats would be stop the climate changing. So the five points I'd end with are um, that climate change endangers the life support systems, that it impinges unequally, uh, that the impacts will depend on multiplier effects. If there's a high baseline disease rate of di diarrheal disease already, then in absolute terms the increase is likely to be very great under climate change conditions. We can embark on mitigation, we must. That's the first order business. And it will in fact provide some local um, collateral health benefits for populations. Less fossil fuel combustion, cleaner air, less respiratory and, uh, and heart disease problems. Less reliance on cars, more use of um, public transport, bicycles, walking, uh, walking then uh, fitter, less fat and more friendly. <laughs> adaptation, is it a moral hazard if we rely just on adaptation? Well, of course it is. The rich countries can do it. We can build the 10 metre sea walls the poor countries can't, etc. So to rely on adaptation as opposed to mitigation is to risk exacerbating even further these uh, inequalities. And if there are some uh, doubters or agno agnostics in the audience about uh, climate change per se, here's the redemption. <laughs> okay, so um, now I'm going to show the final slide, and I have to apologise for this. I only allow myself one of these tricky PowerPoint little devices per year, and unfortunately you're that audience for this year. Thanks very much, Tony. So our final speaker in this session is Professor Stephen Howes, who after... Um, a uh, very stellar career working on development issues in a variety of um, organisations, both here and overseas, is currently Director of the Development Policy Centre in the Crawford School in the um, College of Asia and Pacific here at the ANU. Thanks very much. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation and the uh, introduction. Uh, you'll notice from the introduction that I, I'm not a health expert. Uh, so I told that to Sharon, but she said she still wanted me to come and speak, and so I'm going to stick to what I know, which is uh, aid and development, but uh, try and link that to the subject of today's discussion, which is uh, international health equity, and I guess in particular the, the global uh, dimensions of health equity. So if, if, if you're concerned, if you want to do something, think something should be done about the international uh, health inequities, then, then what can we do? Well, of course, one thing, as we just heard from Tony, is we can, we can do something about climate change, and I'd certainly support that. But I'm going to uh, focus my uh, remarks today on, on aid. Uh, that's an area I've worked on for a long time, and it's uh, something I'm doing right now. There's a review underway of Australia's aid program. Um, our aid program is doubling, so you're going to hear a, a lot more about it. It's a good time to focus on aid. And it is, uh, after all, you know, the most practical thing that we do as a country uh, to try to improve outcomes in other countries. As you probably know, uh, rich countries give uh, some $120 billion a year to the poor countries in the form of aid. Whether this works is a source of much debate and probably one of those questions that's just too hard 
or ill-defined for us to answer. Certainly, it's kept many economists busy trying to work out whether aid has worked. But one interesting thing when it comes to health is that I think there's a lot of agreement that aid does help health outcomes. You might have heard of Bill Easterly. He's one of the most trenchant aid critics around, certainly the best informed of the, of the aid critics. And uh, he writes in his various books, but especially his 2006 book, uh, The White Man's Burden, of what he calls the tragedy of aid, that so much has been spent over the years and so little achieved. And uh, it's a well-known book. It was recently cited by Greg Sheridan in The Australian when he mocked the government and the opposition for committing in a bipartisan way to increasing aid uh, to 0.5 per cent of GNI by, by 2015. He said, read this book and you'll see that it's gonna, the money will be wasted. But there's an interesting passage in this book by Easterly which completely undermines uh, the case that he's, he himself is making uh, against aid. And that's when he writes that don't abandon all hope, even with all possible bureaucratic pitfalls to making aid work, it sometimes does. And he goes on to write that in fact, foreign aid likely contributed to some notable successes on a global scale, such as the dramatic improvement in health and education indicators in poor countries. Life expectancy in the typical poor country has risen from 48 to 68 over the past four decades. 40 years ago, 131 out of every 1,000 babies in poor countries died before reaching their first birthday. Uh, today, it's 36. So this is a major concession by Easterly, uh, and, and I agree with him. There's a lot of evidence at the micro level of aid funding for specific health interventions, uh, which worked. And so to try to um, kind of pursue this um, concession or this um, weak link in his argument, I calculated that this increase in life expectancy from 48 to 68 over the last 40 years corresponds roughly to an additional 87 billion lived years, right, spread across all those additional people that live for longer, uh, during which time about 2.3 trillion was spent on aid. Now we can attribute some of these, these additional life years to that amount of aid. It's not clear how much. If we attribute the entire amount, the entire increase to aid, then it comes to an additional year of life at a cost of $26. If we think, well, it's just actually 10%, mainly domestic effort, but aid did help, then each additional year came at the cost of $260 of aid, and so on. If it's only 1%, it's $2,600. Either way, it's incredibly cheap and effective. Uh, I, I, I did a bit of a search of the literature, and I saw the US government puts the value... If you look at US government spending, it seems they value an additional year of life at over $100,000. So it looks like aid has been a very productive and very equitable investment. I'm not making... A, uh, I wouldn't say aid has worked in all cases. In some cases, aid's probably made things worse. But overall, I think especially when we look at improvements in health and education, uh, we can see a link uh, from aid. It's much harder when we try to see whether aid's helped countries grow faster. And growth seems actually more difficult to achieve than improvements in these basic social indicators. Uh, but these improvements in social indicators are extremely important. Uh, so that's my four point. I'm going I'm to make four points altogether. The second point is it's very tempting to make a, a, a slide from the argument, well, aid's been very good for health, to say, well, we should spend more aid on health. Uh, this is an argument that, in my opinion, uh, should be resisted. Uh, I'm not saying we're spending enough on health. Uh, in absolute terms, uh, you know, in absolute sense, there is obviously massive underfunding. And I'm not saying there aren't particular interventions where you could make a case for more funding. And I think there's a lot of evidence to show that medical research for diseases of the poor is something that would have very high returns. But what I am arguing against is the general proposition that the proportion of aid devoted to health should be increased, as against, say, aid for education or aid for roads. Now, I'm not saying anyone in this room would make that argument, but a lot of people do. Uh, there are a lot of lobbyists out there uh, for the health sector when it comes to aid. And, and I'd resist that argument on three grounds. Um, the first is that we are already spending a lot more of aid money on health. It's become very popular in recent years. So from nine, since 1990, aid on health has, has basically almost quadrupled from 6 billion to 22 billion. So its share of total aid has gone from about 10 to 20%. Right? It's become very popular to spend aid on health. Uh, second, uh, there's massive uh, fragmentation and indeed dysfunctionality in the international health sector. Uh, I told Sharon I wouldn't use PowerPoints, but I, I couldn't resist uh, using this one when I was thinking about the presentation. So I just have a couple of PowerPoints, and I hope this one's going to work. Um, but it, il it's, it illustrates, uh, it's by my uh, friend uh, Jim Tullock, the enormous number of uh, organisations that populate the international health space. Uh, there are more than 100 uh, multilateral organisations, and then of course all the bilateral organisations are active in health as well. 
And you can imagine if you are the poor health minister in a country like uh, East Timor or uh, Uganda and you're trying to make sense of this, uh, it's, it's not, very, not very easy at all. So I think health aid is uh, particularly inefficient. Uh, but my third and most important reason uh, against arguing for more aid to health is one that has just been made today uh, by Sir Michael where he said uh, every sector is a health sector. And of course I guess this is what underlies you know, his entire uh, thesis and body of work that even if we want to put health on the top of the list of things we want to improve, uh, it doesn't mean that you'd spend more aid on health. You'd want to support uh, education, you'd want to support sanitation and clean water, you'd want to build and maintain roads to get more income into people's pockets and, and to get ultimately more income into the pockets of government just to pay for all this. And then you'd want to change social attitudes, uh, especially attitudes to women. Uh, it's a long and daunting list. Uh, and this takes me to my third point, and, and so I'm making this negative point to build up to, to uh, what I hope is a more sort of constructive contribution. If, if the way to improve health outcomes isn't just to give more and more of the aid budget to health, well, what is it? Uh, of course, we could give more aid in total. Uh, that's, that's happening here, but aid will always be, be limited. Uh, so I think we need to focus a lot more on improving aid effectiveness, uh, tackling the sort of problem uh, illustrated uh, by this, this graphic here. Uh, improving aid effectiveness has many dimensions. It's a long and uh, complex subject, but if I had to sum it up very briefly as I'm going to today, I would say that if we want a more effective aid program, and therefore, among other things, better health outcomes, uh, we need to have better scrutiny, more scrutiny of the aid, of the aid program. Uh, one problem with aid that uh, makes it difficult to be effective is precisely the thing that so many things matter. And so what you see aid agencies ending up doing is a lot of a, a lot, a little of a lot. They will spend some on health, they'll spend some on roads, they'll, they'll have a gender program. Uh, aid programs will spend themselves uh, will spread themselves very thinly. Uh, and this is not just for technical reasons, because although that is part of the problem, that there is a good argument for everything, uh, it's also because of deeper political economy considerations. If we think about what sort of debate we get around aid, you can really think there are three camps. You know, there are those who will just take a pot shot at the aid program for political reasons. We've seen this in recent times with attacks on the aid program after the uh, Queensland floods, you know, charity begins at home. And a uh, recent campaign, just the last couple of weeks, you know, trying to portray totally inaccurately that the aid program is riddled by fraud. So there's that kind of pot shot uh, group. Then there are those on the other extreme whose real case is uh, that there should be more aid. And, you know, that's, they, they've been very influential. We think of the Make Poverty History campaign, and, you know, if you believe in aid, they, they play a useful role. Uh, but they're certainly not going to criticise the aid program because it could lead to a loss in public support. And then the third group are those with a sort of stake in the aid program, the NGOs, uh, the different sectoral groups, including in, in the health sector. And um, they're not going to really you know, say anything very critical either because they, they've got a, a stake uh, in, in the aid program. And so what you get, it's not that no one takes an interest in the aid program, uh, but there are very few who have an interest in offering sort of critical commentary uh, on the program. Uh, very few who have an interest in looking across the program uh, looking at issues like concentration, uh, selectivity, and impact. Uh, and I think the aid program suffers as a result, uh, partly because aid, like any other area of government, would benefit from the sunshine that critical scrutiny affords. But it's particularly important for aid because, you know, aid is an area where the typical feedback mechanisms uh, don't work very well. You know, if no one collects your rubbish, well, you'll complain, you know, to, to the local council. But, you know, if no one maintains the road uh, somewhere in... Um, uh, East New Britain, you know, it's not very clear how the person uh, who needs that road maintained is going to complain to the Australian aid program. And even if they do, uh, they don't vote in Australia, so their voice isn't going to really count. So scrutiny is particularly important uh, for, for effective aid. Uh, of course, scrutiny requires transparency. We need to know what the aid dollars are being spent on. But I think here uh, the Australian aid program could do more, uh, but has made a lot of progress uh, in recent times. There have been a number of reviews recently, including the one that's underway at the moment. And if you look at the website, you'll see a lot more information now about the aid program uh, and, and how it's being spent. So I really think now it's up to, to us, to the public and to the academic community in particular, to, to respond and to try to increase the level of debate and scrutiny which the aid program is subject to. Now, I have to admit I'm being totally self-serving here because um, that's exactly why we set up this development policy centre. Uh, 
And I'd like to uh, just draw your attention to the centre, which we set up late last year, and to our development policy blog. Uh, we don't only focus on aid issues, and I'll come to PNG in a minute, but certainly uh, aid effectiveness is one of our most uh, is one of our core areas. Um, and I'd certainly invite you to, to check out our blog site and, and to contact us if you're interested in getting involved. I think it's a really important and great time to have a debate about aid. The aid program is expanding. There's bipartisan consensus around that. So in a sense, the issue about how much aid has been spent has been taken out of play for the time being. And we can really have that debate about how best to spend that money and, and whether we are getting a, a good return. Uh, finally, uh, I want to change tack uh, away from aid uh, somewhat and, and just uh, leave you with some uh, closing remarks about our region. I, I said I'd uh, talk about Asia Pacific, but in fact I just want to say a few words about Papua New Guinea. I think there's often a, uh, a, a limitation on our, on our discourses when we think about um, health equities or, or any you know, issue of social justice uh, or global justice. We tend to have a very vigorous debate about, around domestic equity and we tend to have a, 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 a not as vigorous but still a, a concern around global development uh, we are concerned about what's happening in the Asia larger Asia Pacific region uh, but we really have very little focus on what's happening in our own doorstep uh, with Papua New Guinea I was very interested to read in one of his articles so Michael illustrated and, and he, you saw it again in the PowerPoints today the problem countries have with national health equity with reference to the enormous gap in health outcomes between indigenous and non-indigenous Australians and Australians. And he portrayed this no doubt correctly as representing one of the starkest, most egregious examples of national health divides. Well it just struck me, and I'd like to suggest this put this to you, that the contrast between Australia and PNG represents perhaps the starkest case of an international health divide. I don't know if you could find any two close neighbours anywhere else in the world with such disparate health indicators. So just to remind you that the closest, at the closest point uh, our, between our two borders, uh, Papua New Guinea is just 10 kilometres away from Australia. So it's a very close neighbour, and it's not an insignificant neighbour. Its population is already 6.5 million. It's bigger than New Zealand. By 2030, it will have a population approaching 10 million. And of course, it is our one former colony. Uh, so there, it's, it's a close neighbour in more ways. It's a close and important neighbour in more ways than one. Yet the differences between the two, and just to illustrate with health outcomes, the differences are extraordinarily stark. Infant mortality, uh, the number of infants who die before the age of one per thousand, I'm sure you all know that, but it helps me. Infant mortality is five in Australia. It's 57 uh, in PNG. Uh, I think among Indigenous Australians it's about 10. So not to underestimate the problems we face at home, but it's a completely different uh, order of magnitude when we compare uh, average outcomes in Australia to those in PNG. Maternal mortality uh, is six per 100,000 here in Australia. In PNG, it's over 700. And of course, these are national averages. If you look at the worst areas of PNG, things are much worse again. We've been doing some work at the Development Policy Centre with uh, Care Australia, looking at some of the remote villages in the Eastern Highlands. Uh, there one finds child mortality at almost three times the national level. So that takes you up above uh, 150, I think it's about 170. Uh, chronic malnutrition and high levels of, uh, of just day-to-day -day sickness. Now I'm not saying Australia has responsibility for PNG, nor am I saying that we can fix PNG's problems for them. Uh, economic history teaches us the clear lesson that by and large countries control their own destiny and that the most important determinants of prosperity, uh, including health, are the quality of domestic institutions. The sorts of things Sir Michael's been talking about, but also uh, things like the, the protection of property rights and the ability to enforce law and order. These are things which only the PNG government can provide, uh, not an aid program. At the same time, it does amaze me that, uh, or at least surprise me, that PNG's difficulties don't get more publicity and discussion here. You know, we spend uh, some f over $400 million a year now in aid to PNG alone. Uh, you don't hear much about that uh, aid at all. Uh, if more scrutiny is going to be applied uh, to the Australian aid program, uh, then I think PNG would be a very good place to start. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions which could be addressed to any of the speakers. Um, it just struck me listening to each of the three speakers that essentially 
what's happening globally is a failure of political will. Climate change, how we deal with um, a very uneven world, one part that's very rich, one part that's very poor for a really inadequate mechanism of aid, and of course on the social determinants. So, you know, this really means we need to look at how, how do you, you know, how do you get a political will to take action on these issues? And it, I wonder if any of the panel would like to speculate on that. Tony? Well, I think part of the answer um, has to go beyond uh, political will. It, it has to extend to um, really it's achieving a better shared understanding of the, the forces that we're un unleashing via the sorts of environmental changes that I was talking about, but also the ones that would flow from the ongoing demographic changes and population pressures. Uh, and I think um, probably my view might be able to extend that. That was a little from your quarter as well. But Fran, I, I think um, that we, we have a serious problem at the moment uh, with respect to the newness and the complexity of these large-scale and complex environmental changes of simply not having the measure of what they signify and what states we're ultimately playing for. So much of the debate um, to date has really been around those more immediate consequences and uh, that includes, as you can see now in Australia, the, um, the, the concern, and it's a legitimate and perfectly understandable concern, about the consequences for electricity prices and petrol and so on, if we would undertake any sort of change to begin to slow down our contribution to this massive and escalating and global problem. That's why I, I, I have to think that the sort of work that we're trying to do, um, to try to make clearer what the consequences could be for population well-being and health and in many parts of the world for survival, what, why that really is. Um, and he was your metaphor again, Michael, the bottom line, where everything ultimately will converge to the detriment of human society. And I think until we have a better shared understanding of um, the states we're playing for, political will stay sort of mired upstream in what, um, in due course, will seem to have been a rather inconsequential um, fretting about um, sort of detail when we sort of just got on, as you say, I think, with the bigger job of, of having governments that are committed. But we rely on democratic systems, so we rely on electorates that understand and are prepared to move the discussion forward and put that pressure on governments. Mm. Not just get their alarm clocks on. <laughs> <laughs> just. Um, great presentation, everybody. Thank you, Melanchia, Institute of Health and Welfare. Question for you, Sir Michael, if that's okay. Um, given that we've got this overwhelming mass of um, information that you and others have, have told us about social determinants and the gradient and everything. Why are we still seeing in places like Australia so much emphasis placed on um, social marketing, um, which is you know, telling people to stop being so naughty and give up their cigarettes and, and, and be healthier, please? And, and do you think that is just another um, iteration of victim blaming? Indulge in a self interior little anecdote. Um, <laughs> a part of this is part of the theme of being apolitical. In, in Britain, um, the coalition government introduced a public health rights paper, which parts of which I was really pleased with, because it actually recognised the wider determinants of health. It responded explicitly to my review on health and public, so that part I was really pleased. And I communicated with the Secretary of State and said, how can you say this? But there was another part. It was about what you're talking about, so-called responsibility deals between industry and public health. And these responsibility deals. And I said to the Secretary of State, history suggests, the history of public health, that advances in public health have come from regulation and legislation, clean water, clean air, healthy workplaces, drink driving, etc. Smoking, uh, voluntary agreements, social marketing, just telling people what to do, don't work. That's what history shows. So I said that very clearly. I go into 
an email in letter of several emails from colleagues who said the Secretary of State for Health was interviewed on the food program on BBC Radio. <coughs> and they were obviously talking about his responsibility deals about food. And he was told that the Lancet in an editorial had criticized the responsibility <coughs> deals. Secretary of State replied, the Lancet. Michael Marmot thinks we did an excellent report. <laughs> 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 My action was highly critical. I thought the business was rather good. Sure. So I was, people started saying, do you realize you're being used by the government as a machine? Well, um, three weeks ago, six health organizations <coughs> withdrew from the responsibility deal on that level. And the president of the Royal College of Physicians wrote to the Secretary of State for Health explaining why the Royal College of Physicians had withdrawn from the responsibility to them and said, Michael Marmot says that regulations, and I thought, well, this is what they made political. So I'm now being quoted by both sides. <laughs> But the evidence is the evidence is that simply telling people social marketing, nudging, which is uh, what the government Britain's discovered nudging, voluntary agreements with industry have not been shown to work very well. My response always when people say, Oh, we've got these young people who are drinking and smoking, what should we be doing? And I say, I wouldn't start from here. I'd start with early child development and education. I would be investing in the key drivers. I mean, one of the issues I'm going to talk about to the, at the Australian Medical Association tomorrow is Britain. We have the highest teenage pregnancy rates in Europe. We you know what the drivers of teenage pregnancy are. They start, they start with early child development and education. Girls with high education don't get pregnant in teenage. They're too busy doing their exams. And <laughs> 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 I'm not suggesting that's why we keep them in school. <laughs> so we really know the drivers. And it comes back to Fran's question, and I agree with Tony. There's the democratic deficit relates to this lack of shared understanding. Um, and somehow there's a gap between, I mean in Britain for example, the uh, British social attitudes show, sorry, can I just give yeah. yeah, British please. social attitudes show that, uh, I'll try and keep it short, the British population think income inequality is too big. Very clear. And yet somehow that isn't being translated into political choices. So they think income inequality is too big, but they don't seem to want to vote for the party that might do something about it, because somehow that view doesn't translate into the political process. And I think that, and I was saying to somebody this morning, I think the third sector has a huge role to play. Uh, the advocates being out there educating, uh, raising consciousness, whether it's in climate change, whether it's in the things that I'm just concerned about. I'm sure that it's vitally important that we try and get a better public understanding. Because in the end, if enough of us think a certain way, our politicians will do it. You know, 90% of the population are marching in one direction. The politicians run around the front of the march and pretend they were leaving. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we need to be headed. So, uh, I think we better wrap up now. I just want to um, thank a number of people. First, I'm sure you'll join with me in thanking the speakers for an outstanding presentation. <laughs> Second is thing is, it's a pleasure to acknowledge our sponsors. Uh, we were supported uh, by both the Victorian Health Promotion Foundation, VicHealth, and also particularly by the Asia-Pacific Health Gain Group, uh, who are 
I'm delighted to welcome to the university today. Uh, most of you are in the audience and will be participating in further activities over the next couple of days. And uh, particularly, I'd like to say thanks to Sharon, who uh, <laughs> we've applauded once, but very much responsible for putting all this together. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>